sorry, I chopped my ear back. Very sorry. Oh, so the motion for the finals reads: This house would break up Reliance Industries, the Adani Group, and Tata Group. And Tata Group. Um, we invite the minister to begin the debate. Just checking that I'm audible. All right. Um, I'll take POIs in the chat as well, uh, but also just like maybe put your hand up on the camera and that also sort of helps. All right. I'm going to do three things in this speech. Firstly, on setup. Then on why we simply get far more efficiency in the market, and finally on how this how this negatively how this will positively impact the way that corporations act, both in terms of the government, in terms of the people of India, and then also on international actors. Firstly, in terms of setup, the way that we're going to do this is firstly in terms of splitting up industry, splitting up industries. This is to say that if an individual conglomerate controls mass media as well as a mining part of the company as well as manufacturing, obviously we'd split them along those lines. As well as this, we'd like to know we'd go further than that because we're not going to establish a, a mass media uh, a mass media monopoly, we're going to split them up further than that, such to the fact that we have a competitive market that exists in each of these industries that have now been divided. But furthermore, we're not just doing it once, we're establishing laws that are just antitrust laws that stop conglomerates from existing. This establishes a ban in the way that you weaponize it, you put in place legislation that stops it existing in the future. And this then means that as well as this, we avoid the harms of possibly conglomerates coming to form in the future because those would then also be broken up and we can maintain all the benefits that we're going to bring you. Firstly, then on efficiency and why we get significantly more of it. First thing is to say that we simply just get more, more competition. I think this is quite clear because when you have a huge conglomerate that controls all of mass media or controls all of a specific industry, then they have no one to compete with domestically, as well as that they lack like significant uh, external international competition. This is to say that it causes a few harms. The first thing is to say that they lack a drive for efficiency for the reason that you push towards efficiency because it increases the amount of profit and allows you to outcompete your competitors. And this doesn't happen when you don't have competitors to outcompete and you can just sit in your sit on your laurels because you don't actually care about outcompeting with them. But the second thing is about innovation because when you innovate you're able to outcompete your competitors. And necessarily then that is why there is a drive for innovation when you have several people and actors within a market. At the point where you don't, you simply adopt, uh, uh, you don't have as much innovation. But furthermore, when you have one conglomerate pushing in one area. Even if you think they have an incentive to immigrate, innovate, they only adopt one strategy to try and in innovate. So there's an outside when you have several actors, it's likely they adopt many strategies, each individually that are unique. And one of those is likely to be successful, meaning we overall get on net more innovation. Noting here on opposition, uh, um, on off, uh, this, um, it is more efficient on the opposition side to instead lobby for subsidies and tax breaks and things like that than it is to push and put money into innovation and into like creating more efficiency. Second thing is to say that it's over. Um, I'll take a POI uh, from closing opposition. Unfortunately for you, this debate is not happening in the Silicon Valley where you need innovation. This happens in a poverty stricken India where you do not have access to basic water. Economies of scale means innovation is not a metric. Accessibility is. Okay, no, 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 no. But the thing is, you do have efficiency in terms of how you establish things in this region, in terms of how you go about allocating resources and how you put things in place. We're also going to further get into economies of scale now. This is to say that they have over conglomerized. Notably, the thing here is they haven't conglomerized into specifically one industry, which is what you're talking about. They have done many industries. And the reason this is particularly harmful is because when you have something that is focused on mass media, as well as mining, as well as uh, as telecommunications, that is an extraordinary harm. Because A, it means they become unspecialized. They don't get to specialize in how to put in place water resources or put in place mining. But secondly, it means there are huge layers of bureaucracy, which waste huge amounts of money that could be better spent in terms of implementing these things in the places that you describe. The third thing is to say, do you simply get diseconomies of scale at the point where you reach such a huge size? You get layers of bureaucracy that take up funding as opposed to putting them directly in, onto the ground. This has two key impacts. Firstly, in terms of access to goods. In terms of outside, they are better and they are lower cost, meaning more people can access them. But secondly, you get higher tax revenue because less money is wasted on inefficiency. So you get more profit that you can tax that the government can then redistribute in terms of welfare system that India might have. Second thing then in terms of our uh, points, this is to say about how corporations act, why it's worse for the government, people of India and international actors. A couple of reasons for this. Firstly, they have huge control over media narratives and narratives and messages. And I'd like to ask you, ask you now, think about why a mining company would want to own the media and want to have control over the media. 
and it is because they get control over messaging. While they're pillaging and fucking the environment of India and other countries, they can control the media to say that it is a good thing, to hide it from the public's view. This means that the public doesn't care about it, they don't lobby the government to produce change, and that is an extraordinary harm. You have people that act in many industries, control the media, those industries lack regulation, and they lack care from the people in society. This means you lack that. The second thing is to say that now that they are so huge, they have huge amounts of funding that they can put towards lobbying because that power is centralized, as well as that they have more lobbying power because they have a hold over the economy, because they produce so much impact to the economy as a single conglomerate, and they can pull out of the economy if they desire to. This means they have huge control over that, and that causes significant harm because that lobbying power can be used to decrease regulation. Things like workers' rights, things like environmentalism do not pass on the opposition side. The third thing is to say they are simply given the ability to price gouge to a huge extent. If you care about giving access to disprivileged groups that don't have money, then you don't want one person that gives out telecommunications because that one person giving out telecommunications can price gauge the hell out of people because those people only have one person who they can go to and they have no other options, which means that they can put the price at a maximum extent because there is no competition to drive that price down. Um, so, and, and furthermore, even if you believe they compete within the same industries, when there are less of them, they're more likely to form a conglomerate and form a cartel in terms of establishing uh, high prices independently of the fact that they would compete. The third thing, fourth thing then is to say that they often gain a monopoly over one specific job market in an industry. And the reason this is hugely impactful is because you need competition in the job market because you need to fight for better conditions. And you can't fight for better con conditions when the choice you have is between a bad job and no job. The only way that you get better worker regulations and you, and when, is when individuals in the market must produce good worker rights and worker regulations because doing so means you get better workers because the workers move towards your company because you treat them better. But at the point where only one person is employing telecommunications jobs, then there is no way that you as someone that works in that industry can choose to, to, to go to a better workplace. And as a result, there is no competitive incentive to increase the, like, um, the standards of living of your workers, which we think is an extraordinary harm in this debate because it impacts the large majority of workers within India. We think there's a huge harm that opposition bench simply has to cop. Um, I'll take another point from uh, opening if you have one. All good, I guess. Um, okay, so the final thing is to say that when they are super large, they're more able to exert control internationally. And this is hugely impactful because lots of these companies are just multinational. They impact other countries. This is like the fact that uh, Adani sets up mines in Australia and in many other countries in like Africa and things like that. And the reason they have more powerful power now is simply because of the fact that they have more money and they have more control over what they're going to do. And furthermore, there is a lack of competition now in the overall international market because you now have one conglomerate from India that produces mining that then goes over to other, other countries. Whereas on the outside, you have several companies from India that would then go over to this uh, go over to this international market and compete. And this means they're more likely to push for different ways, like doing it more environmentally friendly, doing it in ways that are more likely to give money back to the uh, to the international market into that international country. This impacts in a couple of ways. Not only that, A, this is often targeted at weaker nations that are unable to uh, uh, overcome this lobbying, but it also impacts stronger ones. This looks like the fact that Australia was forced to have a mine from Adani, even though it was domestically unpopular. Noting here, if they were good, as the opposition is likely to tell you, it's likely to happen on our side because the individual people within that market would say, yes, let's have our dining build up a mine. But the reality is the only way that it happens when it's domestically unpopular is when there is huge amounts of lobbying from the conglomerate that forces the forces that government to go against their domestic popular opinion, uh, the, the domestic opinions. And that happens on the opposition side when you have huge conglomerates who have far more money. For those reasons, I think this is a clear government win. Thank you very much to the speaker for that very fine speech. We'll call on the next speaker, Claude Desjardins. Uh, hi guys, my audible. Yes, yes you are. Oh, let me just arrange my sheets. I'll pick your eyes in the chat. So, cool. Uh, sure. Um, shout out to the University of Cape Coast Debate Society, the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology Debate Society, uh, the Ghanaian Debate Community, and also, yes, go watch the shaft and subscribe. Okay. Thanks, everyone. I'll take your eyes in the chat space. So, feel free to put your requests in there. I'm going to begin my speech in three, two, 
one. There are three key things I want you to take note of India now. India is on the cusp of development, which means they are looking to capitalize on the international market and create much more expansionist view. Secondly, they have a high population that is struggling economically, which means cost of living is a huge thing. And anyone who proves that you maximize the ability for people to afford daily living goods is very, very significant, especially with things like energy, um, electricity, transport, etc. Thirdly, demand is really, really high due to the high population, which means you need companies who have the muscle to be able to expand their production in ways that meets that demand. So let's talk about the three men then. I think on up, we can use that same political power that prop wants to break them up to deal with the negative externalities while maintaining the positive aspects of conglomerates. So for instance, you can set price caps for them, place mandatory requirements to get government approval for price changes like MTN has been mandated to do in Ghana, which means that there are still ways in which you can make use of this political capital to legislate around the most extreme negatives. And I'm going to show you why we do that in a way that presents, preserves the most unique positives about conglomeration. But thirdly, just this is as a preemptive, if anybody comes to say these guys are inducing corruption within India, one, I think their premise relies on the absence of corruption or at least a decently functioning government to be able to implement this breakup, which means the degree of corruption on their side, they can't, like, the more they prove corruption, the more their model is implemented in a very symbolic way. So just as a preemptive note that. Let's talk about three things. A, why current conglomerates would keep prices low and why they do this much more efficiently. One, because low prices is the basis on which the seeming monopolies are justified and legitimized to begin with, which means that's the very premise on which they've been able to amass more patronage, more buy-in. And note, a lot of these companies equally started with competitors, and a lot of them have even overtaken pre-existing competitors. And so they had to prove their worth in order to be able to gain this massive market share. Secondly, because of how huge they are as OG pings, raising prices usually has pronounced effects on the economy due to the widespread influence that they have. So it brings immediate shocks such as impact on inflation and makes the government keep a keen eye on them. And because of that alarming implications that they are changing in prices usually have, they're very, very cautious about the degree to which they change prices. And usually it's very marginal and very soft so that they do not have negative implications. But thirdly, the scale of demand and the market share they have combined with the benefits of economies of scale also make, um, make them have very high profit margins, which means that they necessarily don't need to raise prices. Usually what they do, for instance, is to leverage on economies of scale to be able to escape inflation of um, um, production lines and product and production like raw materials because they buy a lot before these prices inflate. And that's why they are still able to keep prices low even when the cost of production materials are high in a way that makes them sustainable. So they really don't need to hike prices. And that's why they don't do it in status quo. Secondly, why is uniquely the ability to be conglomerate valuable and functional in this? Because note, they are going to say uh, they break them up and they still maintain their companies. Here's a couple of reasons why. A, because it provides them diverse industries to operate in. Because note, in the, um, India as, an in, uh, as a country has um, varying performances of various industries. So at some point, the agricultural perform industry performs slightly low, energy goes up, etc. Being able to be a conglomerate means that they have cash cows where the industries are performing well, and they are able to engage in cross-funding such that this enables them to maximize the most um, aspects of the economy that's performing, to be able to sustain their industries within underperforming aspects of the economy. And that's how come they are able to reflect lower prices even when things are going bad in those aspects. Secondly, because of complementary servicing, because a lot of companies have to employ other companies to be able to um, complement things like energy supply, etc. What being a conglomerate allows you to do, and this is how conglomerates are usually formed, is to create industries in areas that you need to fill up your supply chain, such that you eliminate that extra cost of being able to give out contracts with high prices, etc. And this ability to create this means that you dump down the cost of production because the industry that's supplying you energy is not putting a, a, a profit margin on it because it's your own conglomerate, which means that you structurally dump down the cost of production and that makes them much more efficient in producing cheaper goods. But thirdly, because of the economies of scale and the ability to hedge against inflation, economies of scale simply means you buy things in large quantities when they are cheap, such that even in the future, when the prices are increasing, you're able to escape that price hikes. What this gives them is the ability to still maintain prices as slow as they need to, even when things are going bad. And that's what makes living conditions affordable for most and average Indians. But finally, because of lower cost of loans, because when you're a larger conglomerate and you are leveraging your assets for loans, it comes with much, much cheaper 
lower interest rates and sometimes even insignificant interest rates. What that does is to create less financial burden on these states, on these companies, which makes them much more financially capable of running lower prices because they don't have high interest rates to pay. This structurally proves the exclusive unique benefits of conglomeration in these companies. Closing gap. India is very, very large. Surely a company that has 20% of the Indian car market or 20% of the Indian electricity market, which is not a monopoly, is large enough to enjoy economies of scale and loans on good conditions. Yeah, on the comparative, it's much better. If you break them down and they are still the same, then you don't have a debate. So pick a side and choose it. Let's talk about the impact. There's cheaper cost of production on our side, which leads to cheaper cost of goods, which creates much more affordability, creates much more access to lower cost of living, meaning that the huge demand and, 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 and the huge demand that's created is usually satisfied due to the higher economies of scale and the higher capacity and the ability to complement needs within the supply chain, etc. Also means that you are able to largely insulate yourself from supply chain shocks because you have more control over the supply chain that you are using within your production centers. But what this also does comparatively on their side is to reduce affordability because you take away all these unique advantages which creates higher cost of production, which reduces the affordability. It also reduces higher like profit margins because less people can afford these things because you are increasing production costs, but also reducing the uh, patronage within these goods. This also also means you reduce tax revenue for the state because the info slide says significant versions of India's tax comes from these guys, which means the less profits they make, the less tax the government makes. Finally, let's talk about the ability to expand globally. Because what you do, um, like Tata, is to be able to create uh, the capacity to expand and export a lot of goods, like the info slide says. And what this does is to create external revenue that um, these big companies bring in from their sales outside to expand local production centers within India. And that's why a lot of uh, these industries come back and expand local production to create more jobs, to create accessibility within those areas. But finally, what you do when you government does this efficiently, is to create an immediate shock within the market, such that there is lack of trust of investors to come into India because they have no security. They think governments can interfere and break them down anyway, which creates much more systemic problems because you cannot stop the demand gaps that you create on their side. Never been this proud to oppose. Thank you very much to the speaker for the first speech. We will now call on the second speaker of the proposition bench. Thank the speaker for their speech. I'd like to invite the deputy leader of the session to in the top half of the debate for us. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, can you see and hear me? Oh, yeah, um, I can see you and hear you. Very much. I'll take POIs within the fifth minutes. And I'll take it within the chat space. Um, and just can you do the timestamp for me? Okay, Andrew says he's going to drop the time stops. Okay. Three, two, one. I'd like to start off by impacting uh, one of our cases which we bring to you, which is the benefits of the international competition which happens. Because we realize that opening governments concedes that our ability to be able to compete on the international stage is diminished. This is a point which they don't engage with, and I think it's very detrimental to their case for a couple of reasons. First of all, right from the info slide, you'd realize that we lose a shit ton of money when we decide to break down these companies. Why? Because now we lack the ability to compete within the global stage. Think of Tata, which probably is not even like top 10 car manufacturing industries, and think of it now broken down into 100 parts like the way they are describing. We lose the ability to compete in there, which means we lose the international market and the revenue which is coming from that, which means we lose crucial revenue, which is going into things like welfare 
and being able to tackle and fight against inflation crisis and price rises within the domestic in in industry and also creating alternative in industries and the competition within those specific countries, which means we lose the soft power and the foreign influence, which is far more tied to our goals, which we prove is more proximate to the Indian government, which is more plausible compared to their lack of characterization of the Indian government and what their priority is. So that large loss of jobs and revenue and investors also being scared away just by the consequences of this action. And mind you, this is independent of us proving that this model would work or would not work or whatever that it, it, it is. And also the large scale devastation that comes to the local economy. Because what they also don't analyze is who fills in the gap. There is an assumption that implicitly you have more members come in there and set up these companies and instantly have competition. But I'm going to describe the nature of these jobs and why there is a specific lack of internal capacity to be able to create this kind of competition, which is the premise of all of the impacts which they have. One, because the scale of investments required for these kind of industries is very huge. Things like energy, things like telecommunication require a high level of initial cost and investment, which you can't get when you break down these, these companies because domestic industries within those countries would be unable to even invest within them in the first place. Most likely, what you're going to have is large international companies who are coming to take up these markets anyway and buy up your markets. We, we all know the impacts that comes with that. Like one, the taking of your jobs away. Two, the, just your lack of ability to be able to control them in comparison to some of these industries which you talk about. But secondly, it is the lower rates of return because with things like electricity, communication, you can't instantly charge high premiums on them in order to make your money. And that is where you have this level of uh, uh, cooperation which comes within these industries because you need to give them significant amount of time and give them significant amount of market share in order to be able to realize that level of impact. So the advantage on our side of the house is the initial investment in the first place. Therefore, as, the, the way on this is that we get the prior uh, 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 investment which requires the existence of these industries in the first place. But secondly, also on efficiency, because we told you, but the way in which the, uh, the, the economies of scale works is in being able to subsidize different parts of the economy. India is a very, 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 very large place. The ability to build infrastructure and pipelines and warehouses requires a, a, a bigger scale of investment and management than they want to say. It means the kind of companies which are coming there lack the ability to be able to spread out and exact the economies of scale which they talk about. So they talk about the economies of scale. I'm not sure why that happens for a, such a huge industry with this huge level of investment because for them to make money, they will need to be able to manage this operationally and, and very well in order to make that kind of money. And I'm, I'm unsure why private companies would want to waste that money in that way. Thirdly, it means they have the ability to keep their prices low because they control all the other parts of the supply chain, which means that they can be able to floor the price and still make profits. And just the reliability that they can keep these industries in the long run, then means that they do not have an incentive to hike the price in the short run. Also because of the specific characterization that your ability to just raise the prices, look at the scale at which they provide GDP to the economy. If they raise their prices, consumer inflation will go high and no government will want to tolerate inflation, which means it gives the governments an incentive to manage them and therefore they will not be stupid enough to just raise the prices like what opening government is saying. What they say around this then also is that there's lack of innovation and efficiency because they are they are lobbying ETC. They do not show why on, on the comparative, this immediately goes away. Why small companies and their competition will not mean that they would also want to lobby in order to have the advantage which they already claim exists within those governments. But one, we lose that global competition. And that global competition is important to create innovations within these monopolies, which means Adani and, and Tata just don't fucking sit down because they are scared of Mr. Bishi and other companies so that innovation happens anyway. Secondly, we have bigger research capacity as a result of the funds that we have. Thirdly, we are able to build large-scale infrastructure and have the investments which are required for these industries in the first place. On their side, innovation and efficiency worsens because even if the incentive exists, the capacity doesn't exist. There's lack of knowledge sharing and them wanting to hold patents, etc., and go against each other. I don't know why everyone fucking thinks competition always leads to the right effect necessarily happening. You need to analyze why it happens and I've shown you how it influences everything on our side of the house. CG. The core of your case is that inefficient parts of the car market will subsidize efficient parts of the market. They're going to waste money on parts that don't work, on infrastructure that doesn't bring a return instead of investing in useful things. 
Look, I, I don't think these companies are stupid. They are making like a shit ton of money over here, which means they're super, super efficient. On your side of the house, most likely the kind of investment that you're going to get from the states who would want, who have the capacity in the first place to manage this or foreign groups who would want to enter to manage this will be far worse. You need to tell me why um, necessarily it gets better. But secondly, it's not as a result of inefficiency. Like you can't, you, you definitely can't control the market and the economic situations which usually happen. And I told you that some industries literally take a very, very long time to be able to come of age and therefore requires the time uh, um, to grow in, in, this, in these instances. What these guys also want to tell you is that governments have the capacity to be able to protect the other industries um, in times of these level of, level of fluctuations, which necessarily uh, um, um, comes in. I think one of the key things we would like to highlight over here is that the political power, which is needed to be able to take down these corporations compared to uh, being able to put in place all of the policies which control them, which Andrew uh, told you about, is way higher, which means on our side of the house, we are more likely going to have these price caps and we are more likely going to hold them accountable in addition to the other mechanisms which we give you than the possibility of them being able to break down these companies in the first place, which means them not explaining where the political will and power comes from and them not explaining how this will be done well and them not explaining how necessarily it manifests means you can't buy even all of their impacts if that's something that we to do and we are proud to oppose. Awesome. We think that speaker for their speech would like to invite the member of government to begin the back off of the debate. Here, here. My audible? Yes, they're audible and visible. Okay, great. Give me a second. Okay, I'll start in three, two, one. Panel, the main thing that the opening uh, tries to discuss, uh, or the opening opposition tries to argue, is essentially, as Roy pointed out, that efficiency is some, inefficiency is somehow better for the economy. And this is something that is exactly needed for a country that somehow badly needs to build the infrastructure and use its resources efficiently in order to actually transition into a developed country. This is absurd on its face, but we'll particularly point out as to how the conglomerate structure of these companies is precisely what is responsible for the inefficiency. And actually, they do not have incentives to actually uh, be profitable. They have much better incentives to build an empire and remain an empire because this is how they survive this is how they uh, 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 this is what they're uh, what's in the interest right now but also toward then i'll point out more, uh, the anti-competitive practices that they engage in not in terms of the new r d and things like that but in terms of the existing resources that india currently has that need to be developed very efficiently in order for India to transition to a developed economy, which simply don't happen when you have the conglomerate structure for where, uh, you know, precisely for the kind of reasons that the opposition says are good, such as vertically integrated uh, uh, companies and so on and so forth. Okay, let's start with the conglomerate inefficiency. Notice that when you have a company, which is not just a company, but like uh, it's in every uh, uh, different branch of the economy and you're controlling market in every one of them to a significant extent and these kinds of things, at this point, you don't really care much about profit. What you care about is building an empire. Why? Because a profit margin of $100 billion versus $150 billion is not anything to you, right? The people who are running this company are already incredibly fucking rich for generations, and they simply don't care because they already have a well-functioning uh, 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 a smoothly functioning machine that just works, right? And there's no competition that, uh, 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 that's able to uh, uh, challenge them to any significant degree. And unlike what the opposition says, that they must have been efficient, that's why they became big. No, when India became independent, these people were just given the whole of Indian economy to develop, and they developed into the monopolies that they obviously were going to develop, right? But at this point, since they already have this kind of a structure, they simply have uh, uh, don't care about pennies on the dollar. What They care much more about having an empire at a nationwide level. Why is this the case? Because First of all, these companies have pride attached to them, right? This is, these are family, familial companies that are controlled over generations by the families. They have this kind of pride that we are the Indian company that controls the Indian telecommunication. We are the company that brought textile to India, things like that, right? And, and, and therefore, they, they care much more about their kind of image and the kind of power that they exert and so on and so forth. But also important, the political power that they exert comes from having an empire, right? Because when you have a conglomerate which is uh, expanded over multiple uh, you know, 
branches of the economy, so on and so forth. This is precisely when you can exert the kind of political power that these companies exert, which can bring down the state governments. For example, notice what happened to West Bengal when they denied to give a, a, a car plan to Tata. And, and, and these kinds of things happen when you have precisely this kind of component, when it's such a vertically integrated economy that can bring down whole sectors of the economy of the state at the same time. And this is why they care about having a, 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 an empire which can exert a power that you simply cannot exert with just increasing the profit margin by a few billion dollars. This is not what they care about, right? And also, they simply don't have. Uh, 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 yeah, so th uh, these are the reasons I think it's clear that they care more about empire than having uh, more profit margin. What this means is exactly what the uh, uh, opposition is already agreeing that they allow inefficiencies in the market, right? They are subsidizing different parts of their businesses. We, we are using the profits from other parts of their businesses just so they can keep this machine running because it fucking runs and they don't care about making it more efficient and increasing the profit because what they care about is having the name that, okay, all of the companies of the tire group are functioning well and then have not gone bankrupt or, or it's the same for Reliance, it's, it's things like that, right? What this means in very simple terms is you're, you're using resources in a low, of, in, in, a, uh, in a way that is less than optimally efficient, right? And you're incentivized to do this as the opposition already agrees because this is, uh, 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 because you're diverting resources and you can keep this, uh, uh, you, you can keep doing this, right? What this means is you're wasting resources of the country. Even if this matter of matter to the company, this matters to the country because India has very few resources that it can develop uh, uh, and mobilize in order to make sure that we have an infrastructure which we lack in fucking more than 60% of the country. 60% uh, like more than 60% of the country does not even have internet. In these kind of situations, every resource is so important that you can, simply cannot allow low efficiency. Low efficiency is the biggest enemy of Indian economy at this point. And what uh, th th this does, is uh, this kind of conglomerate structure, is exactly subsidizes inefficiency. And this is why it's the original sin that we cannot uh, forgive in this debate, right? And again, this is uh, just uh, the things that go along with the empire. But also, why, another source of inefficiency, not just in terms of subsidizing the things that are not working and actually improving them, but also just in terms of managing these things, right? When you have a conglomerate, which is so big that you have like corporate structure of each company, and then you have a mega corporate structure, a meta corporate structure between the companies, the manager of scale at which these things happen is simply becomes like uh, uh, you know an in uh, uh, you know inefficiency at scale something like that right because you, know, you are not investing resources in productive capacities but you are investing resources in secondary activities that are maintaining your empire which is like a framework around this productive capacities so these are uh, this and this is precisely again a unique reason that uh, relates to conglomerate which gives inefficiencies again more inefficiency means you are wasting resources that could have otherwise go, uh, otherwise gone to building more productive things uh, uh, that could have actually uh, uh, make structural changes in India that can make India a more developed economy. Before I go on to the anti-competitive practices closing. Oh, uh, what kind of a country do you think India is? Uh, what are your thoughts on Modi? Okay, thank you. Let's start with anti-competitive practices. Why the vertically integrated structure is specifically not uh, a good and is a wasteful for resources. Notice that when you have a vertically integrated structure, you're incentivized to not compete at each structure of this vertically integrated structure. So if you have Tata Steel, which produces steel, which uh, uh, provides uh, steel to the car companies, which means that uh, and the car market is also controlled by Tata, which means that there are no other steel providers that can compete even at the level of steel because the major uh, person who is buying this is also Tata. So this means that the customization is happening at the level of the company to maximize the profit of the company, but this simply does not respect the market mechanisms which would otherwise ensure maximum efficiency at each level of the vertical integration, such that you are again using resources in the maximum level, which means more deliverables for the people. Second thing, predatory pricing. This is also something that conglomerate can uniquely do, right? Because the normal antitrust law would actually make sure that if you have a single company in a single sector, it cannot, uh, 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 you know, engage in anti-competitive practice and artificially lowering the prices so that you can uh, outcompete the other company. But when you have a conglomerate, you can do this, right? When you have a conglomerate, you can use the resources of the whole conglomerate in uh, in, in, in a way such that. This can be done, and you can actually run other companies out of business. This, this is exactly what Reliance did with the geo telecommunications, right? And, and the, finally, you can simply pressurize other companies using the political power that you have to bring down whole economies of state, as I mentioned, because of this conglomerate structure over different sectors of the economy, and this also further reduces efficient use of resources. For all of these reasons, please break them up and do it be much better. Awesome. We think that speaker for their speech would like to invite the member of the position to present the case. Position. Yeah, here. Yeah. Hi, am I audible? Yes, you're audible. Cool. 
just a second. Cool. Um, I'm not looking at the chat. I'm not looking at the screen. Uh, I'll ask for a POI. Just uh, one thing before I start my speech. Uh, thank you so much, Sudeeksha, for doing this tournament with me. Uh, it's been great fun uh, despite uh, having survived Bhavana Ki Gold Cup. Starting in 3, 2, 1. Opening government proves in this debate that corporate capture will happen. And this is their best case because their claims are that impetus to be efficient are foregone when the aim of your conglomerate is to expand, strengthen and lock the levers of power. That means over time, they gain so much like power that efficiency becomes a secondary like idea because you can just brainwash people into believing that this is that they want through media control and things like that. O never explains why in the long term you can maintain these tax revenues, you can maintain these compliance from these conglomerates or why complacency won't set in generally. Then the first thing that we are going to prove, and this is where we situate our extension, is prove to you why in a country like India, corporate capture is impossible and there will always exist political will to control and regulate these corporations. That's the first extension. The second extension is why the capacity to replace these conglomerates exist because they have a similar level of competency yada 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 i'll tell you how this fares against other teams later then first extension then why in a country like india corporate capture is insanely impossible and hence whatever oji says is untrue even in the best case there are three board mechanisms firstly we think that the cult of personality that exists around Narendra Modi is insanely strong. First, this individual is extremely strong to rally behind because of a couple of reasons. A, there is no fracturing within the right of who is the light, right leader to lead their country. Everyone unanimously agrees that Narendra Modi should go for a third term if you belong to the right. It's by virtue of the economic progress that they have brought and the other things that they have done in terms of advancing their Hindutva agenda and whatnot. But secondly, revisionism has been successful in like the last 10 years that the BJP has been in power like for. They have been able to attribute all long-standing problems to the Nehruvian era which we saw in the, the 15 years post-independence and say that all issues right now are a consequence of the long-standing issues and problematic policy that was passed between 47 and 62. This kind of historical revisionism has been even more successful considering that they own a lot of state media, a lot of BJP members have significant stakes in a lot of news channels and newspapers papers and things like that. But thirdly, the agenda that they claim of economics is extremely good because the past governments had a particularly shoddy record when it came to scams and corruption scandals and things like that. The narrative was that they are looting the government and looting the Indian citizens. That is like the Congress party was not at all like good at like leading economic growth and things like that. But the bigger problem is for the first 40 years, India led a socialist policy and all of that was Congress led. So people have still not been able to shed the kind of like 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 the kind of like economic downturn that had like that caused us to go ahead and like 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 sustain and things like that the second thing here is that India has a powerless opposition. There are two reasons this is true. First, the only opposition right now, that is the India bloc is falling apart because leaders within themselves are not able to generate a consensus as to who is the person who can go ahead and hold a candle against Modi. Is it someone who is extremely experienced like Nitish Kumar or it's sometime someone who is extremely contextually relevant like Malik Arjun Kharge and things like that. But secondly, the biggest opposition party which is Congress is seen as a family, family of dynasts and the latest dynasty is someone seen who's seen as a political failure because Rahul Gandhi's all like all three generations before Rahul Gandhi had been the head of states of India and his inability to go ahead and live up to the hype is something that has hurt them deeply not just hurt them deeply but it has resulted in trends of memification and further vilification of the Congress party the third mechanism to note here is that BJP has an insane amount of power even independent of Narendra Modi they are extremely active in the Hindi belt and they had need like they have independent 
independently 350 plus seats in the Lok Sabha, which is more than the simple majority. That means they have a significant amount of media capture. They're able to enact historical revisionism and they're able to curb dissent by going ahead and passing policies which go ahead and curb on the freedoms of minorities in India. When all of this is true, it proves that the center is extremely strong and it has an extremely strong hold over its people. What does this prove for the debate? This proves that they have the ability to comply the kind of like, like generate the kind of compliance that's needed for all the economic benefits from these companies to flow. That is to say they have the capacity to regulate them effectively. The second burden then in our extension is why do they have the capacity to replace any of these? That is to say, why are these three conglomerates competitive within themselves? Why won't they cartelize? There are three reasons for this. A, CG themselves mechanizes this, that that all of them have been dynastic family businesses. That means all of them have had similar trajectory paths, like a growth paths and things like that. So they all have equal core competencies and that offers a diverse range of offerings to the government insofar they want to go ahead and partner with any particular one of them. This looks like when in Delhi, they wanted a service provider to partner with in order to subsidize the electricity connections that come to Delhi households. They were able to choose between Tata Power and Adani Power by virtue of the massive hold that both of them have. But secondly, all these three conglomerates were able to crowd out other competitors except these three themselves by virtue of the massive economies of scale that they operated in. But thirdly, like next, we think there is a massive lobbying power that all of them have been able to attach themselves to by virtue of the massiveness of our country, because there's a lot of lobbying factions that you can latch on to. That means, and like lastly, there is a, like, there is like, massive public approval for all of these conglomerates because all of them have done massively in terms of CSR, building hospitals, giving back to the poor and whatnot. That means they're interchangeable to the same degree. The last thing then we have to prove is why is there an incentive to regulate effectively? OG before I prove this. Your explanation of Modi's personal cult following and power explains exactly why it is when he is lobbied, no one backs an eye and all of our impacts land. Four conglomerates, though, don't compete as much as the number of conglomerates on our side. Thank you for conceding that competition is good. You know, the point is Modi's agenda is of economic growth. And if Modi selectively floats tenders for Adani, and if Adani does nothing but slack off, then Modi has the capacity to replace Adani. That's what our extension has proved. In order for the Modi bandwagon and hype train to keep going, he has an incentive to regulate. If you were not listening, now is the time. The last thing then, why is there incentive to go ahead and do this? Because of the explanation that I had. The biggest thing or the biggest agenda that BJP came to power on is their economics. They're able to successfully show and increase the rate of growth that we have right now. And this was a significant pivot from the Hindu rate of growth, which is a median rate of growth of about 3.5% that India enjoyed for the first 60 years of their ruling. India right now is facing a lot of flag for their human rights abuses and things like that. And the only thing bailing Narendra Modi and his government out is the economic front or that they have. This proves the incentive for them to regulate effectively. We proved the capacity. We proved interchangeability. We proved why these have died, like why they are competitive within themselves. We win because of the politics of this debate. Awesome. We thank that speaker for their speech. I would like to invite the government to close the government bench. Here, here. Hi, am I clearly audible and visible? Okay, excellent. I'll start in three, two, one. We win this debate very simply. We show you the greatest degree of inefficiency within conglomerates within this round. And that means we show you the least efficient investment and the least growth in infrastructure development and success of India in the future. And this is the thing that all teams at the end of this round agree is the most important within the long run. Before we get to our case, a few points of direct rebuttal to what we've just heard. Because OO is saying economies of scale a lot of times as a slogan. But the sole mechanism they have within economies of scale is, look, they're going to get cheaper loans. Now, look, we're not talking about mom and pop stores, right? The question is, do you really believe that NVIDIA has to take very expensive loans while Apple takes very cheap loans. 
it doesn't make a difference because neither of those companies is likely to go bankrupt. There is very little risk, so the loans are very cheap for both of them. We think even after you break this Indian conglomerate, they are still very big because inherently India is a very large country. So if you control 15% of Indian transportation, you are still a very large company, right? You're not talking about breaking them into tiny, tiny companies. So the extent of impact that economies of scale can have in this debate is very small. The second thing is, OO tried to tell us that the government will control prices, never raise prices, and this was going to prevent inflation in the long run. Look, if the government is going to control prices and never raise prices, the only thing that's going to happen is shortages, because eventually it's not going to be financial for the companies to actually produce anything. We think, A, it's very unclear what is going to work. B, they don't analyze to us while they'll be able to control prices effectively or wisely. We don't think this is particularly relevant. Finally, when they tell you that the companies are going to pay less taxes, note it's completely dependent on the question of the companies being worse and less profitable. Because if you just break up the same number of companies into smaller companies, they make the same amount of total profit between them, and therefore they pay the same amount of tax. They only pay less tax if they're actually smaller in the long run. Before we get to that, Let's answer some of the things CG tried to, CO tries to tell us, because CO tries to tell us the basic thing, the next following thing. We're going to have excellent regulation because there is no way to do a capture of somebody who is very popular. But look, why is Nandra Modi very popular? It's because all of the media sites are friendly to him, but they're not owned by Nandra Modi or the BGP. They're owned by Relax Industries and Adani, who are literally bankrolling his campaign. That means that to a large extent, what we are saying is, look, they already captured Modi, and what is CEO's answer to that? Modi needs economic growth in order to be popular. Note, it doesn't show us he needs maximal economic growth. They don't show us he needs 8% economic growth. He just needs the economy to be well enough that India is setting their life to improving. We think that in the short run, sure, 4% and 8% might sound like very, very different. But 12 years from now, 8% means you've doubled your economy and 4% means your economy is only 50% larger. The gap is massive. And we think it's important that we take account of it. We understand that, look, growing is not enough. It's growing as fast as possible. And the fact CEO shows in Nandra Modi's incentive to make sure the economy is growing does not show that he has incentive to maximize the growth because destabilizing his own support, destabilizing the country, taking a risk is something that is unbeneficial to him when he's so politically dominant and he can just continue doing what he is doing now and stay in power. Let's get into our main case and understand why it's so impactful in this debate. Because what Vig uniquely shows you is why the people in control of those companies, the managers, the owners, have an incentive not to maximize profit, not to invest in the most efficient parts of the business, but to make sure all parts of the business stay afloat. So maybe what India needs is a port that's going to have massive workflow, but in order to keep the railway afloat, they need to build a new rail station. In order to keep the rail business afloat, they will build a new rail station because they care about maintaining all parts of the business. They care about being in everything. They care about preserving their empire, about their prestige, about their ego. And this is a very large delta in this debate. And note, OGO already considers as cross subsidies is a key part of the mechanization. So I think it stands very strongly what in this debate this is an agreement in short diagonal. What does this tell us? It tells us that you're investing in worse parts of your business that have worse returns that are bringing you less economic return in the long run. It means that you're investing in a car factory despite the fact that you're having to sell those car prices at prices that are practically lost prices, where you're not returning the value of the factory you've built because you want to say, yes, we still have a car company. It means that instead of building the electricity grid you need, you're building a, a new train because you think, yes, we still have a train company. You're justifying yourself by building that. And that means you're getting much worse return on this investment. Why does this beat out OG? Because OG fears competition, but what they don't show you is why they're going to be so much more efficient because their main mechanism for why these companies are going to be inefficient is they lack drive. But the fact that they lack drive doesn't tell us they're going to be inefficient when most of the investment India needs, as all teams in this round agree, are actually not new high-tech super innovative investments, but building basic infrastructure in the right places efficiently. That means getting places connected to uh, basic sanitary equipment, it means getting places connected to electricity, it means building railroads. And when you need those things, you don't need particular drive to do so, you just need to choose to be efficient. And we uniquely show you in this round that they're choosing not to be efficient. Note, it's much more important than the bureaucracy that we are getting for opening government, because no matter how big you think the bureaucracy is, let's say 10% of the corporate expenses is bureaucracy. We are saying you all their investment is prioritized on the wrong things because they're using their cash cows, the most efficient businesses, to subsidize businesses they should just not be keeping, that are inefficient, that are wasting resources. And India lacks investment. This is the key thing they lack, investment to build infrastructure, to investment to rebuild their country. And this makes a massive difference in this debate. Before I continue, I will take uh, opening, sure. 
Yeah, so we prove our counter prop to mitigate all your state capture analysis. But also, I don't get it. How does subsidizing an industry that needs investment any more different than new investors coming to build all those same infrastructure? And all of a sudden, that is harmful. Like, make it make sense. It's very simple. When you subsidize an industry that is less efficient because you do it historically, right? Not because it needs investment. They don't subsidize because it needs investment. They subsidize because it's an industry that exists is losing money, so it needs subsidies to continue existing, and therefore they are continuing to invest in it. However, they have other industries which are making money, which are much more efficient for India, that they are not investing it because it's a zero-sum game, right? When you are a conglomerate, you invest in one industry or the other industry. You can't invest all the money in all the industries at the same time. You have a limited amount of money. That means that when you are making a choice to cross-subsidize, you are by definition choosing to opt out for less efficient option and for less significant option. Finally, let's weigh the question of conglomerate efficiency over competition and why it is more important. I think that competition gets very good rebuttals from opposition, which I would like to flag just so we note it. It gets the fact that there's significant international competition from other companies like Mitsubishi, like other Amazon, and significant competition between those cartels. I think in so far as it doesn't show that OG is wrong about there being more competition, just the extent of more competition they can get is very limited by existing levels of competition. The extent of inefficient investment, inefficient conglomerates we can have is massive because there is no incentive for them to focus on investing in the more efficient parts of the economy and therefore vote CG. Sorry for the delay. As we just take down, um, we think that's good for the speech. Let's invite the opposition to end the forum. See you here. Um, hi. Am I audible? Yes, you're audible. Cool. Um, uh, before I start my speech, um, shout out to Sai for uh doing IIT Bombay with me. I learned a lot from you throughout this tournament. Thanks for carrying me through all the rounds. And um, yeah. Big, uh, like not throwing up after Bavana ke uh, never having them again. Cool. Starting in three, two, one. I think, I think CJ is out because their premise is inefficiency of these companies. And the mech they used to prove this is that they are rich dynasties and shit like that. And they want to maintain an image. I can just flip this mechanism on them and prove that if you want to maintain an image in front of the public of that country, you probably want to keep on sustaining your business. Insofar as you want to sustain your business, at that point of time, you're more likely to go ahead and have more revolutions in the first place. You're more likely to go ahead and include more subsidies for people so that they keep on buying into your business and buying into your conglomerates at a point at which you want to sustain and want to sustain that dynasty you want to maintain an image at that point of time i don't think there's any likelihood of them being inefficient the only responses they can then claim is that hey you probably just don't care no do you care about the image because if your image falls down probably you can't sustain within that business because according to what whatever government says like smaller companies aren't getting any sort of picture because of these specific big companies which means if at a if at a point at which they become loose there's always a chance for like smaller companies to rise into picture because that's literally how they come into power etc etc because of all of those reasons in terms of sustenance their mech is flipped on them but second in terms of the idea that they just provide a lot of subsidies i don't see an issue with this because at a point at which india is a poor nation and people want subsidies because they have less purchasing power i think which we're still fine if these companies are able to provide them with good, good subsidies because that's exactly what the people of that country want at that point of time when you're able to fulfill the needs of stakeholders i think there's no need to break them up cg is out of this debate a couple of things on extension then and how that deals with the opening half first on the idea that how state has more incentives to regulate this stuff note modi wants to come into power within the third term i can literally see on all news channels in terms of how he's saying that i want to come into power uh, next year also modi sarkar will be in the power which means at that point of time modi is desperate to come into power modi is already getting a lot of 
like a lot of abuses in terms of why is he only focusing over religion and stuff like that at that point of time the only metric on which modi can win this election is on economics this means that modi has incentives to go ahead and regulate the economic industry of india whereas important and like better and more proximate need what then whatever opening opposition claims because they don't fulfill their burdens in terms of global impacts and shit like that because they see that hey globalization is important because um they say that globalization is important because you can have better research i don't think like they are ever anywhere fulfill those links i think whatever sai does in his speech is first prove that what whatever is modi's cult of personality in terms of modi wants to maintain into power at that point of time i think sai was able to prove to you that in so far as modi offers a tenure to like adani and if adani fucks up modi has any incentive to go ahead and offer that similar tenure to ambani and take it away from adani which means there is some sort of competition already existing there's the kind of claim that og pictures in terms of there is no competition within the industry i think Like Sai was able to prove that why these uh, like uh, com- why these conglomerates don't have any incentives to go ahead and collab like collaborate with each other, but rather stay in constant competition because these also want to earn the most amount of profit. They also want to stay within power as much as possible. They also want that political backing because political backing also means that they're more likely to get more funds from politics, like more funds from these political parties, and like m- more political backing, which means that you're able to get more campaigning power ex- and lobbying power within. in the country at that point of time we think that we have the more proximate benefits towards these companies to not fuck up i think oh's idea here is that look uh, you will be you are offering a lot of tax revenues to this government and that's fine i think they never explain to you that what exactly are these tax revenues doing there's something site specifically does within his speech when they talk about how these companies are specific incentives to go ahead and offer csrs to go ahead and offer like more recruitment opportunities and employ more people within their company so that more and more people can earn more amount of money which means this increases the purchasing power of like the people of the country at that point of time we think we have taken the debate from opening opposition because number one they never prove their incentive in terms of how globalization is important i think globalization is important specifically on our side and why modi and these companies have more incentives to do so because they literally want to increase that lobbying part i think this og's claim that comes into picture in terms of how um, a domestic cup like australia is probably forced to have uh, adani build mines within australia i think that's still fine because adani is number one giving more amount of employment opportunities to those people as well which means they are able to generate more amount of economic opportunities within that specific area but second in so far as all the benches within this debate agree that india is a probably a developing nation and poor nation at that point of time it specifically increases the bargaining power that india wants within this like india wants within the status quo because of all of that reason i think they are able to prove that because the, the impact is that you are able to generate more bargaining power for india within the status quo this proves that why modi has specific incentives to go ahead and regulate lead these businesses in the first place the government side issue with us is that hey regulation is impossible i think sai is able to prove within his member speech that why regulation is the only way through which modi can win elections in so far as political parties want to win elections they have the most priority basis in terms of how to re- how to like revolutionize the economics of a country at that point of time we think that modi has incentives to go ahead and do all these kind of things third on the idea of scale of demand and how these companies have incentives to offer subsidies oh says that look they want like they just offer subsidies because they want to i think sai explains you two things first in terms of how state cap like media capture of these companies isn't possible which means at that point of time modi is a specific actor and state incentivizes these companies to go ahead and like offer subsidies which means these companies are pressurized by state to go ahead and offer subsidies this thing is a more likely scenario to offer subsidies in terms of we have a more likely scenario that people are able to get more subsidies on our side of the house but second in terms of you are able to je- like in like why state capture is the only way in which media offers i think state if like state capture happens which i proved extensively which means that media doesn't have any incentives to go ahead and cover up for the fuck up that these conglomerates are probably doing which means uh, media has all of the incentives to go ahead and call these structures out at that point of time gov oti specific claims in terms of media capture happens and media never covers their fuck ups for flat because state has incentives to cover their fuck ups so that they can like actually show accountability and show that this is the reason why we aren't investing within this specific conglomerate 
conglomerate and like funding other specific conglomerate. I think three paths to victory in terms of how CEO wins this debate. First, in terms of more proximate impacts at why these conglomerates want to offer more subsidies in a more likely scenario in terms of the offer subsidies. Second, that why state has a major role to play here. Third, in terms of um, why like these companies care about their image, literally flipping CGs on impacts for all of those reasons closing up. Awesome. Thank you guys for all the wonderful finals. We are going to proceed to breakout room one to deliberate. And after that, you get the forward closing ceremony. Um, so can all the judges move to break our room one? <laughs>